way back in September, I think, or maybe it was even summer, we began a journey through the Gospel of John. And uh, we made it up through uh, John chapter 15, verse 11. And so then, uh, you know, we got into a meditation on uh, the story of uh, Messiah and his incarnation. And, um, you know, I, I did a couple sermons on, uh, you know, the new start and the new year and, and uh, you know, looking to the Lord, uh, forgetting those things that are behind, looking forward to the, the future that God holds. Um, so I just want to do a short review, maybe about five minutes uh, about the Gospel of John to bring us up to where we are in chapter 15, verse 12. So we know that the Apostle John wrote uh, the Gospel of John along with the three epistles, the letters. I, I remember hearing a joke, you know, that uh, they give a test for a catechism in the Catholic Church. Uh, what are the epistles? And one boy wrote down, the wives of the apostles. And I, <laughs> I thought that was a pretty good answer, you know. But the epistles are the letters John wrote, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He also wrote the book of Revelation. He was known as the apostle of love. And he not just wrote about love, he wrote about the author of love, God himself. And the supreme manifestation of that love in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So John's gospel gives us a different perspective from the three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And the record of uh, the Lord's life from a deeper, more theological perspective comes from the gospel of John. John's gospel is the only one of the four that contains a precise statement regarding the author's purpose. It's found in chapter 20, verse 31. But these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So John's gospel is primarily twofold. Number one, evangelistic. And number two, apologetic. You remember that, uh, you know, Peter wrote, always be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within you with meekness and humility. That's, a, that's the uh, apologetics part of our Christian faith and wit witness. So the evangelistic purpose is clearly evident by the use of the word believe. John used the word believe over a hundred times. And he composed his gospel to provide reasons for saving faith in his readers. And as a result, to assure them that they would receive the divine gift of eternal life. The apologetic purpose is closely related to the evangelistic purpose. John wrote to convince his readers of Jesus' true identity as the incarnate God-man, whose divine and human natures were perfectly united into one person who was prophesied as the Messiah and Savior of the world. John organized his whole gospel around eight signs. You know, we call them miracles, you know, starting with the changing of the water into wine and all the way to the uh, miraculous catch of 153 fish after his resurrection. These signs reinforced Jesus' true identity along with the seven I am statements, which I have been focusing on in uh, preaching through the first uh, 14 chapters of John. He started off and he said, you know, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall be saved. And he who believes in me shall never hunger or thirst. So that was the first of the I am statements. Oh, we know that the I am is the name of Almighty God. 
And so in witnessing to uh, my Jehovah Witness friends who always want to change the subject about, you know, uh, you shouldn't have a blood transfusion or celebrate a birthday or anything like that. Uh, I, I just come back to the deity of Christ. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. I am the door. Anyone who comes through me shall be saved. I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. I am the resurrection of, and the life. He who believes in me, even though he dies, yet shall he live. I am the way, the truth, and the life, he said in John 14, verse 6. No man comes to the Father but by, by me. And then finally, in chapter 15, the last of the great I am statements, he says, I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, the same will bear much fruit for without me, you can do nothing. So that's the great, the last of the seven great I am statements. This is who Jesus is. You know, he was God in the flesh. The great I am. So summing up, the Gospel of John focuses on the divinity of Jesus as the word made flesh, the son of God, and fulfillment of all of the messianic prophecies given about Messiah. Studying prophecy is, is faith building. You know, when we understand that, that God, through the prophet Isaiah, prophesied that, you know, Cyrus would come down and, you know, do what he did as an instrument of God, and he called him by name a hundred years before he even was born. You know, God has a plan. And this is the plan. And it's, it's unfolding even as we speak. And so, it focuses on the divinity of Jesus. And number two, it focuses on the one who brings the gift of salvation to mankind. That it's only through Jesus. I'm the way, the truth of life. No man can come to the Father except through me. And number three, the re response of the people. They either, either accept him or reject him. Of course, some of them say, I, I want to hear more about this. And that's true in our own personal witness. You know, we always need to be ready to experience the opposition. You know, that people are going <laughs> to tell us to keep our mouth shut. But anyway, you can't uh, muzzle the gospel, or the gospel, Paul said, cannot be kept in prison and in chains. Uh, and we have the freedom, hallelujah, that we have the freedom here in these United States to speak up and to proclaim the truth. Hallelujah. So in the first 11 verses of chapter 15, again, he says, you know, I am the vine. And he talks about abiding, abiding. That means resting. That means remaining. That means living in that place with God, not just on uh, a Sunday morning, but living with God day by day and moment by moment, you know, giving thanks and praise to his name in all things. Because this is God's will for us. And so, we're going to pick it up in chapter 15, Gospel of John. If you have your Bibles, open up to chapter 15. I'm going to be begin reading in verse 11. Okay, Verse 11. Lord, we thank you for your word, that your word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Lord, uh, here we are. We present ourselves to you, and we invite your Holy Spirit to speak to us and to minister to us. Open up our 
uh, spiritual eyes and ears to receive everything that you have for us. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. John 15, verse 11. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you that you love one another. So we talk about joy and and we all want, you know, uh, to experience uh, joy. You know, I I just remind us all that, you know, happiness is is different from joy, you know. Uh, Happiness is something that is circumstantial. You know, oh, I can be happy that... You know, I got my bicycle fixed and I can start riding it again or I can, I can be happy about uh, this uh, new rug that I got <laughs> for the house or whatever, you know. But, but joy is something that is, is deeper, it's long-lasting, and it's not so affected by uh, circumstances. Joy is something that we have even in the middle of conflict and confusion. You know, let's remember that peace is not the absence of conflict, but the presence of God in the midst of conflict. And so it is with joy. I love the psalmist. He says, Lord, in the midst of my anxieties within me, your uh, comforts delight my soul. That's joy. That is joy. This is why our persecuted brothers and sisters in many parts of the world can still experience joy even though they're being beaten, downtrodden, under the thumb of despotic rulers and reigners, tyrannical maniacs. You know, they can still experience joy. And so there's a simple formula, and not really a formula, an an acrostic, J-O-Y, joy. If you want to experience joy, what is it? J, Jesus, O, others, and Y, yourself last, you know. Esteem others more highly than yourself, you know. And uh, boy, that solves a lot of it right there. Put that ego right on the altar, the sacrificial altar. We talked about that last week, didn't we? This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Everywhere I go, I see all of these signs, and you know, they bother me. I don't like going to the pool. Yeah, I hope they open it soon, but there's a list like it, and it's in fine print, you know, don't do this, don't do that, but, you know, and oh man, it's endless, and so, you know, you go to the beach park, and it says no, 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 and, you know, dealing with the public, all of that, but, uh, you know, all of these rules and regulations. Basically, the Mosaic Law was given as a rule book. And uh, the Bible teaches, that, teaches us that no one could ever perfectly fulfill it. Only one person do. That was the God-man, Jesus. He fulfilled it perfectly so that we could be free from the rule book. Now, hang with me here. God has rules. And, uh, (laughs) you know, we don't want to get confused about that, but this is the rule Jesus gave us. It's a commandment. It's not a suggestion. It's a commandment. This is my commandment. Love one another. Now, that is a very simple rule to remember. But can we apply it to our lives? Let's remember that knowledge without application equals frustration. Knowledge plus application equals transformation. 
And so that's God's intent for us is to be transformed. Is to be transformed. So if we want to keep it simple, let's remember Jesus' first commandment. In another place in the Gospels, they came and asked him, you know, said, what's the first commandment? He said, love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then the next one is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. So those two go together, right? Love God and love one another. Hallelujah for that. See you guys. Allah. Love one another. Wow, that is so simple. And that's what I love about Christianity. It's simple. It's not easy, but it's simple. Even a little child can understand it. Little children grow up in, under our you know, uh, watchful supervision, and we seek to lead and guide and direct them. And, and, and the one thing we want to teach them, the one thing they need to know is when I am asking you to do something, do it. You know, and if, when I tell you don't do something, don't do that too, you know. Because if you do, if you hit your brother, bright your brother, hurt somebody else, you know, ta you know do something like that, there's going to be correction, loving correction. Because I love you, I'm going to correct you. And uh, God does that to us. But it's obedience. What is the one thing God asks the, that we ask of our children? Obedience. That is exactly what God asks, asks of, of us. <laughs> Obey my command. Love one another. As I have loved you. There's the, there's the clincher. We can love one another when we feel like it. We're feeling good. We're well fed. You know, we're had a good night's sleep or what, you know, we got money in the bank or whatever. But, but try loving e each other when you're down. You know, you're tired, you're hungry, you're frustrated, you're at the end of your rope, and, and God says, yep, this is, where, this is where your love ends, Stephen. You cannot do it. You need to call upon me. I have a big reservoir of love, but you've got to call upon me, acknowledge that you can't do it, and ask for help. And I think that's the simplest prayer. I think that's the greatest prayer. In the Bible, Peter said it when he was sinking. Help me! And then he was in the boat with Jesus again. That is a very good prayer to remember. Always remember the name of the Lord that you can cry out to him and he will meet you in that place. Praise the Lord. But he calls us to sacrificial love as I have loved you. Stephen, how did, you, how did I love you, Stephen? Well, you know, I, I died for you. I died for you. This is why when we consider our salvation, you know, it is, we're not bought with, uh, you know, gold or precious gems. We're bought with the blood of Jesus. You know, hallelujah, we sang, worthy is the lamb, worthy is the lamb. Why? Because he is worthy. He paid it all for you and for me. So can we love sacrificially? Sacrificially. You know, what, what about the woman who uh, uh, gave the two mites, you know, less than a couple of pennies? It says that she gave everything that she had. She gave sacrificial, sacrificially even of her own living. She said, oh, okay, I, I, maybe I could have bought a piece of bread with this, but I can give it to the, the Lord. You know, our, our life, when it begins to hurt like that, you know, and we kind of go, oh, you know, somebody just called me from uh, Kona, you know, their car broke down, and, and uh, it's 10 o'clock at night. Man, I don't want to do this. When I feel that and I hear myself talking like that, I know. I know what God wants me to do. He says, listen, man, lay it down. Lay it down and get up and do it. And, uh, you know, there's been times when I haven't done it. And, you know, 
that's, I, I missed my blessing and my opportunity. God found somebody else to do it. But when we hear God directing us, it's important to obey his voice. And then we experience something that is miraculous. We experience the power of God moving in us. You know? And uh, it's, it's like the analogy of the glove. You know, we're just, we're just the glove. And then God puts his hand in there and wants us to use us to touch and to minister to others. And when that happens, we get filled with the joy of the Lord. It's indescribable. You know what I'm talking about. You know, that joy comes with living sacrificially, with listening to what God has to say and then applying it, obeying it. Greater love has no one than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. This is a reference to the supreme sacrifice that Christ was going to make. He was swiftly approaching the cross. And he said this, Greater love has no man that he would lay down his life for his friends. You know that as Christians, the word Christian means small, little Christ. And as followers of Jesus, as little, little Christ, we are called to follow Jesus' example. With the same sacrificial giving towards one another. Even if such a sacrifice would require us to lay down our own life. You know, you ask a mother or a father, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, would you lay down your life for, for your child? You know, actually that does happen to a certain extent. A mother, you know, gives up her, her own body to be the, the avenue through, through which a child is born. That's a great sacrifice. You know, and a, and a father uh, should indeed sacrifice all of his efforts towards uh, his wife and, and children. We're even commanded in Ephesians, as husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. And so we see a sacrificial giving at the core, at the core of Christianity and at the core of our lives. Praise the Lord. He goes on and he says, You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. <laughs> our relationship with God will be tested through obedience. Oh, you say that you really love me? I want you to love this person over here, that person there. Oh, man, Lord, that one, you know, the, the one that knocked on my door and, and cussed me out for being a preacher of the gospel. You want me to love that one? Yep. You know, when I got that message about that individual, that it did happen, I, I was set free. I wanted to, you know, call out the boys and go hammer the bugger, you know. But I couldn't do it. It was like, I want you to pray. I want you to pray. I want you to love that person. Just pray for him. I began to pray and pray and pray for that person. And, and, uh, and now it's, it's, uh, it's a different thing. I mean, there's still a lot of work to do. But, uh, you know, we, we're not reconciled completely. But I'm free. Hallelujah. If you do whatever I command you, so our, our relationship with God is going to be tested through obedience. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. Who do you think of when you think of someone being called a friend of God? Abraham. Abraham was called a friend of God. Why? Because God 
brought revelation to him, spoke to him, and said, you know, that if he obeyed him, that he would make him as the multitude, you know, his descendants as the multitude of, of the stars in the sky, the sands of the sea. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him as righteousness. He became a friend of God. He could have just said, hey, you know what? I don't believe that. I'm going back to Ur, you know. But he moved forward in faith, moved forward in believing God at his word. So he was called a friend. It was because of his faith. So too, we are privileged to be called a friend of God. Jesus said, I call you a friend. Why? Because of our faith in what God says in His Word and believing His Son who says, I am the one who gives eternal life. You know, Believing that He is the great I am, the great God-man, the Savior, the Messiah. And it was for His friends that He laid down His life. He laid His life down for you. Because you're his friend. And you can become his friend. Believe what he says. Follow him. Surrender to him. And follow him. Verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. And that your fruit should remain. That whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Those are, that's verses 16 and 17, I believe. No, just verses, uh, verse 16. So the privilege of being called a friend of God was not merited or earned, but freely given by our sovereign God. Just as God chose Israel and called them his chosen, his elect, So are we, his church, his elect. It is not because of any merit or favor or anything that we could have done or can do. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, lest any man should boast. I chose you and appointed you. You know, God chose the nation of Israel so that he could bless them and then that they could be a blessing to all of the nations. Read Psalm 67. It's a great missionary psalm. And it speaks about that, you know. That God would bless the nation of Israel. Everybody would look to them and go, Wow, how, how come... This is happening to you guys. You know, there's peace in your streets. You know, your barns are filled and everybody's uh, happy. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. But Israel missed it. They began to look at it and go, we're we're the apple of God's eye. You know, the center of God's uh, love. We are his special people. And you guys are like, I, I hate to say it, but we're, put on the same level as dogs. They missed it. And they kept it to themselves. They became myopic, just looking at self, and egotistical. And then they, you know, pride comes before destruction. And here we see this pattern within the nation. God's chosen people of turning away from Him. Time and again. And then a righteous king leader would come up and it'd be good for a few years and then he'd come back again. They were always turning away from the Lord. They missed God's purpose and intent as a nation. And God's not done with the nation. God is still using the nation of Israel. All of the prophecies spoken of the nation of Israel will come to fruition and fulfillment. And God is going to use them in a mighty way in the last, you know, final chapter 
you know, d during the tribulation and, and all of that. Um, but he, he, I chose you and appointed you for a purpose. So we just spent several weeks meditating on Luke chapter 2, the longest chapter in the New Testament, 78 verses. And there we have the most detailed account of Messiah's birth and the names and descriptions of individuals who were chosen by God to play an important part in God's plan. We read about Zechariah and Elizabeth and their son John. We learned about Mary, a young virgin girl, and uh, just the miraculous conception, the divine conception of the God-man, Jesus, the Messiah. We learned about Joseph and his struggles with it all and how God spoke to him. We learned about Simeon and Anna who were looking for a Messiah, saw him when he was presented in the temple, and then went and told others. Each was chosen by God and appointed for a purpose. They each had a unique and important part to play in God's greater plan. We saw that just as John was chosen and appointed to deliver a message, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, a message about the first coming of Christ, the first advent of Christ, we as followers of Jesus have been chosen and appointed to announce his second coming. Hallelujah! Jesus is coming back. We have that privilege. And we are appointed to that, share that message. We saw that just as Mary was favored by God to carry Messiah in her womb, that we as followers of Jesus have been favored by God, chosen and appointed to carry the most precious gift, the Holy Spirit, for it's, we don't carry this, we carry this treasure in earthen vessels, Paul said, that the excellency may be of God and not of us. So we've been chosen and appointed to be his witnesses, just like Simeon and Anna, who saw the Messiah and then went out and told others. They did something with that. They shared their faith with others. The purpose of sovereign election, remember, God is sovereign and He does what He wants. We just need to trust Him and obey Him. The purpose of sovereign election is to bear fruit. He says, I've chosen you to go and bear fruit. Personally, in our inner man, the fruit of the Spirit sanctification, you know, what is the fruit of the Spirit? We sang a song with the kids, you know. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and faith, meekness, and self-control. All is in Christ, Galatians 5.22. God wants us to bear fruit in our own lives. And the process of bearing more fruit requires the Holy Spirit to bring conviction and say, hey, you know the way that you just talked to that person? That was not me. That was wrong. You know, the way that you dealt with this, you, God corrects us. And then we, we repent and we say, okay, God, help me. Help me with my tongue. You know, help me even with my motives. The inner man being transformed into the image of Christ with uh, righteous living. We have a banner inside. It says, you were created to become like Christ. God created you for fellowship with Him and to become more like His Son, Jesus. For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You see, it's a walk. You know, faith is a, a walk. We put feet to our faith when we walk and we do what God tells us. God has prepared us for that. 
these good works. It's not by these good works that we earn merit or anything. It's by these good works that we give gl- glory to God. You know? It gives us an opportunity. People say, hey, I, I saw how you handled that. How'd that happen? I said, hey, if it wasn't for God, it wouldn't have happened. You know, so we can give God the glory. And that your fruit should remain. That means per- be permanent, not fleeting. You know, not just patient one day and uh, out of control the next day, but uh, solid, steady. That your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Now, here we go. It's a difficult passage. I don't pretend to understand or know that. This is what I do know. We've already addressed this as far as prayer and uh, how to go before the Lord in John chapter 14. Let me just read it again. John chapter 14, verse 12. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, I will do that my Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. These are difficult verses. We need to remember that he was not speaking about us personally performing miracles greater than he did. In fact, we can't do anything greater than he did, you know. I I mean, we can... Just walk in the Spirit and allow the Spirit of God to do great things. He's talking about in extent. The greatest thing that we could do is maybe have an influence on someone for their eternal destiny. This is why Jesus came to the earth for souls. And yet he remained in a very small area, less than, you know, a radius of like 60 miles. And now look at what has happened. Through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the gospel has traveled to the ends of the world. Greater in extent, greater things, more souls saved to the ends of the earth. And I'm not saying that God doesn't do miracles. We could stay here for the next week and probably testify about miracles that God has done for us and, and in us. The focus is on the spiritual always. Always on the, the, the spiritual, not the physical. Souls are the most precious thing. Why? Because God says that the earth is perishing. Everything's going to perish except what? The word of God and the souls of men will last forever. So let's always keep it simple and remember. To get on our heart what God has on his. and On his heart are souls. Individual souls. He came to Zacchaeus, an individual up in a tree. He came to the woman at the well, an individual. God takes you on a journey and you meet people individually. Be in prayer. God wants to use you. And he wants to use me. So we have here... A word from the Lord to ask anything in his name and he will do it. This is not a formula to tack on to our prayer. You know, and just say, oh, you know, I pray this and that in Jesus' name. You know, and so I expect it to happen. It is a prayer from the heart. The believer's prayer should be for God's purposes. Not selfish purposes. In James, he says, you ask and receive not because you ask for yourself. So let's look at our prayer life and see if our prayers are, you know, uh, for his purposes. Number two, that the believer's prayer is on the basis of Jesus' merit, not our own personal merit, not anything that we have done. You know, I love the, the passage in, in Hebrews where he says, you know, let us come boldly to the throne of grace 
that we may find grace to help in time of need. But the verses that precede that in Hebrews 4 say this, Seeing that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. So it's in faith that we come to the Lord in prayer. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Now we have verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is a prayer, you know, that is in pursuit of God's glory in people's lives, in our own lives, our families' lives. You know, Martin Luther, Martin Luther King Jr. was named after Martin Luther, the uh, Catholic monk who came out of, you know, the, the rules of Catholicism and became a great, uh, you know, warrior for faith in Jesus. Faith alone. Uh, and in his preaching and in his teaching, he developed it on the five solas in Latin only, only, you know. Sola gratia. I, I don't know Latin. Sola gratia. Uh, by grace alone. Sola fide. Through faith alone. Solo Christos, through Christ alone. Solo Scriptura, through Scripture alone. And the final one, solo, sola Deo Gloria, for the glory of God alone. Alone. Let that temper our prayer life. And let's be faithful in prayer to come before the throne. How does it say? Boldly. Because of what Jesus has done for us. Hallelujah. The final verse of our passage this morning. These things I command you, that you love one another. The same place where we started out. Now, when somebody says something once, it's important. I tried to teach my kids, you know, hey, the first time you hear my voice, try to respond. But, you know, I give them a second chance, you know. And then sometimes a third chance. But you know what? I learned that as I gave them more chances and they weren't responding, my voice was starting to rise and I was getting frustrated. So I read a book by Dr. Dobson, you know, and he says, you're the one who draws the line. You're the one who draws the line. Teach them to respond the first time. That's the way God is with us, too. He wants us to respond. To him. Here he says it twice, and he says it many times in the New Testament. It's the same message, it's a simple message. Love one another. Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that that you have preserved your word for us, Lord, and that we can walk with you, commune with you as we meditate upon your word and we grow in our faith. Lord, thank you for this time together this morning. Help us to not just hear what you tell us to do, but to obey it and be like the wise man who built his house upon the rock. Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Father, for the privilege of being called your friends that you've called us out of darkness into light, that you have chosen and appointed us for a purpose greater than ourselves. Lord, help us, Lord, help us to walk in the Spirit and bring glory to your name in the days that we have remaining. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Again, thank you for coming and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit 
keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus today and throughout this week. Uh, go in peace. 